How's it going everybody? My name is Dave Whipple and you're watching Bush Radical. Today I'm here with Brooke, my wife, also known as Girl in the Woods. We're going to go through our 10 items that we took out to Vancouver Island on Alone Season 4. Stay tuned. Alright, let's get into what we took and why we took it and whether or not we take it again and if it was a great ingenious idea or if it was completely stupid. Let's start with, uh, let's start with Gorp. This isn't Gorp, this is a Gorp substitute that's just something in the bag. This is old cranberries. And it calls in the predators in the area. So you've got to feed them and, and make them go away. Daisy loves cranberries. <laughs> Here you go. The Gorp we took out was actually peanuts, raisins, and chocolate chips. Dark, Good chocolate chips. Dark chocolate chips. Well, you're right. <laughs> Those are terrible. They've been cranberries in the... are junk, man. They're like a thousand years old. <laughs> They've been in the cupboard too long. So yeah, we each got to take two and a half pounds of rations. As you, That's one of the things you could choose. So that was definitely both something we both wanted to take. So we each took the same thing. We each took the gorp. And there was a lot of different choices. You could take pemmican or beef jerky or flour or... There was lots of choices. But hindsight, I think the Gorp was the perfect choice. It was perfect. And why was it perfect? When you're starving, you want so many different things. But Gorp, it will give you a flavor of three things. You get the protein from the peanuts and the salt. Raisins are just something sweet. And the benefit of the raisins is after a while, the peanuts in the bag, all the salt, came off and landed on the raisins. So you had like this sweet and salty raisin, which was just amazing. I'm sure the raisins got some kind of carbohydrates and so does the peanut. Yeah, definitely and carbohydrates. There's like nothing in nature that's good for carbohydrates out there. Nothing. You're just eating protein when you eat. And then of course the, the chocolate chip was amazing. To have, just let that little piece of chocolate melt on your tongue. It was really, really nice. Having chocolate out there was pretty special. It got down towards the end where we'd eat our raisins in thirds and our chocolate chip. It'd take a couple minutes to eat a chocolate chip. And it was such a treat a couple times a day, just a little tiny pile of that. And you could have a little bite of each one. And, uh, you know, the, the funny thing about it is, like, people like, I'd take beef jerky or I'd take pemmican. It was a two-pound bag that we took. I could pound two pounds of beef jerky on the way to get more beef jerky. <laughs> it had never lasted. And it would have just been redundant because we had all the protein, all the stuff we had to eat was all protein anyway. We didn't have anything else and jerky would have just been more protein. Yeah, it was an amazing, amazing thing to have. Dave, once we got together, of course, our time together didn't start until day nine. So after that, he was kind of like in charge of the bag of gorp for whatever reason and it was like pavlov out there every time i'd hear that plastic i would just be like oh it's time for just a little you know tiny handful of of whatever maybe a couple raisins maybe a peanut maybe a chocolate chip and it was such a big deal and i was pretty proud of us that we made our gorp combined last 40 days which was an incredibly long time for such a small amount of food. And I think the reason I ended up with the gorp in like my possession is because we had a mouse get into it on a couple different occasions. So it ended up going in my backpack. It was heartbreaking. But something that can last for 40 days and every day you have a couple little bites of something th that you could never find in nature. It, it was the perfect choice in my opinion. Totally. I would not have changed that choice. No. That was, it was a perfect choice. I would still stand by that to this day. Do you want to add anything on the gorp? This smoke is now going to the cameras. <laughs> this is ridiculous. We moved the cameras just to fix the smoke problem and now the smoke's going that way. Let's move on to the rest of the gear. And we took this coffee pot. This beauty right there. Now, we picked this coffee pot up at a yard sale several years ago for two dollars and it's probably from the 40s it's very heavy duty aluminum 
it's probably the most solid two quart pot that you're gonna find because it's you know it's 50 60 years old and as far as what we thought of that what was your impression of the I pot? love this pot I mean this was such a lifesaver to have a pot we, we were blessed with a nice creek nice crit coming right out of the mountain fresh water we never even boiled it but by nature we boiled it for tea every day anyway but we drank right out of the stream it's coming right out of the mountain and so we got to have tea every single day and we only had this pot for tea we did not put any food in there and when it's so cold and you're you're just needing something hot to drink having a dedicated vessel just for tea was really awesome it was really the key i love this pot it was a great choice not only is a pot like this a little bit different because it doesn't have a bale but we didn't we, we never hang anything over a fire we just chuck it in the coals next to the fire but it's got a bake light handle never burned uh it's just a you know it's got a percolator unit that goes in it you know it's a coffee pot we didn't take the percolator. No, no, we didn't take the percolator, but the pot, this is probably an heirloom quality pot we'll pass down to our kids. It's that nice of an old pot. Can I have a shot of tea? Absolutely. We got some pine needle tea going in here right now. Some white pine needle tea. Out there we drank hemlock tea every day, at least one whole pot. And um, This is the bottom of the barrel, so it's got, can you grab my cup? Oh, I didn't see it over there. It's got a lot of junk in the bottom, but... Not every item we picked was a great choice, but this pot was. This is the pan we chose to take. Our idea was we'd keep our food and our beverages separate by having a frying pan and having a pot. That way you're not, you know, cooking fish guts in the same thing that you're trying to drink warm liquids out of all day. And the pan? The pan was a dollar. It came from a flea market. Now one of the things alone, they only let you bring a steel pan. You can't bring anything else. So of course you get into the ocean environment and it's going to get really rusty. Although yeah. we did treat it before we left. We seasoned it. There's virtually no way to keep this from rusting out on the ocean. No. Um, Overall thoughts on the pan, we both agree we would not choose this again. Huh. It was, it had a couple of utilitarian purposes. I used it for sc scooping beach gravel when I made both of our <laughs> fireplaces. Um, it was also good to, to use as a catch when yeah. we were shaving wood to start our fires with. You get a big pile of shavings and then hit it with a barrel rod. Yeah, at the end of our stay, this was basically where I kept all of our fire starter stuff, all of the shavings. It was under our bunks, and every time we would start a fire, you just pull this out, and there's your stuff. But as a one item to take along with you, it definitely wasn't worth taking a pan to do what we ended up doing with the pan. And now, that, also, it's because we cooked every single fish that we caught right over the fire yeah we didn't put it in any kind of a vessel um and that really is such a great and efficient way to catch to cook your fish so we just didn't need the pan hindsight what would you have taken in place of the pan oh i totally would have taken a leatherman leatherman would have been really nice if you if you wanted to stay with the same idea uh two pots i could see two pots you could do a fish soup that's always cooking along with your grilled fish you know like a fish gut soup fish head soup but uh, that frying pan if it was a stainless steel pan it probably would have got used more but it didn't take any time to get it to rust and there's no way to keep it maintained in that environment it yeah. wasn't the best idea I remember cooking limpets and some um, periwinkles <laughs> Gunnels. And we some gunnels in here. And what you end up doing is you get that not nice fishy flavor with just a little flavor of rust. Yeah. And it's really unappealing and really unappetizing. So it didn't take us long to not use this pan. That was a gross meal. It was a gross meal. But we, we, you know, for scooping things and moving material, I mean, it is something that was sturdy and you could use it for that. Makes a decent shovel. Yeah. All right, let's talk about our tarps. 
we each chose a white tarp and white on purpose. We each had five items we could pick beyond a knife, a sleeping bag, and a ferro rod between the two of us. So we each got five choices. We each chose one tarp. So we took two tarps as two of our ten items that we could pick. I couldn't be happier with choosing a white tarp and choosing two of them. We were going into a rainforest. I mean, the biggest thing you've got going against you is the, the dampness, the wetness. You have to keep dry. And knowing that we were going to have two tarps. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. It, it was huge. We actually used one for our shelter. And even so importantly, we had like this dedicated, our other white tarp we dedicated to an area to cut all of our wood. And I mean, we cut wood, we cut wood and we cut more wood. So having a place to get out of the rain and cut all your wood for the day. I'm gonna retake that, I'll get, fine, get out of there, Daisy. Get back there where the cranberries are, hippie. I'll give her some. Why white? Well, the fact of the matter is, a white tarp? Yeah, there's no, there's nothing else. Okay, I'm gonna redo that. Why white? Uh, psychologically, white is superior to every other tarp in the world. If you're under a green tarp, you basically have this green pall cast upon everything. It's, it's like being seasick without being seasick. Brown is, is almost dark. black. It's, you know, it's going to make everything you do inside that much more dreary because the light is going to be so poor. But with white, it's just like daylight underneath the tarp. And it made all the difference. There's not even a there's not even a plan B. It's a white tarp or nothing if you've got a choice. And, and how do we know that white is so effective like that? That's because all of our time spent in Alaska, we've spent a ton of time living in white wall tents. Lots and if of you've time. ever been in an army green wall tent, you know the stark difference between having all that natural daylight around you and just having feeling like you're in a cave huge difference to your mental um, stability and that was going to be a big deal out there is keeping your brain from <laughs> ingesting itself from imploding so the white tarp was the one of the best decisions we made yeah if you're working on something everybody knows somebody that's got a garage that's just a dungeon it's super dark you go in there's a little light you can't see anything and it's a miserable place to work now imagine if you were working inside of a greenhouse that's all clear and it's just like daylight but inside. That's the same thing you get with a white tarp. When you take your area that you're in 12, 14, 16 hours a day and you make it just as bright as it is outside, it was so pleasant. It was so wonderful. It, there's just, there is no other option. It's white tarp or, I mean imagine being, being under a blue tarp. I mean, green's bad, and brown is like, you're just in a dungeon, but blue, oh my goodness. Just kill me just, now. Yeah, it's just depressing. All right, the next thing we brought is fishing line and hooks. And we found that all the fish out there really did better on a smaller hook. Larger hooks, they seem to be, I mean, it's a small mouth fish. Even the bigger fish, they're a smaller mouth fish. There's nothing out there that's like a pike that could swallow a, a softball. You know, the small hooks seem to work the best. One of the things too was the fact that you, know, you can't bring any spectrum or spider wire or anything out there. So it's just monofilament. So we brought, and you can bring uh, as many different sizes as you want, but it's a 300 yard limit. We brought a 20 pound test a 10 pound test and a 50 pound test. Yep. This is the fishing pole, <laughs> for better lack of a term, that Dave carved for me out there. And what we would do is just wind it on. You just need something that will wrap around that so when you throw it out, it just kind of comes off the end of the, uh, the fishing pole here. <laughs> I don't know what you call this. And we had two different types of weights. We, the biggest problem out there was we're fishing off the rocks and the rocks are covered in barnacles. So it's totally always catching our... Snags and breaking line and break, cutting line. Yeah, cutting our line, grabbing the hooks. We're losing hooks. 
And it's crushing to lose hooks out there because you just have 25 hooks. And uh, That's one thing we found really quick right off the bat. After you start losing a few hooks the first day, you're like, this is gonna be, this is gonna be the, the problem. So we, we kind of had to figure a, a, a way to work around that. And we'll get to that in another video. Yeah, but this has worked out so good. I would say that the, the 20 pound test, it worked great for rigging up sinker rigs. Um, the 50 pound test was our go-to line. It was strong enough to straighten a hook out before it broke. So the benefit of a, of a thick, heavy line like that was pretty obvious. The 10 pound test, it didn't do jack. It really had no value whatsoever. It, we couldn't find anything to do with it. It was too light. It broke too easy. Um, it was a bad idea. Next thing we decided to bring was an obvious choice again for us, which is the ax. And Dave is, uh, he has restored and redone so many axes. This is really his lane. I'm gonna let him tell you about the ax. I've talked about this ax on my channel lots of times, but the thought behind the ax is just as important as the ax itself. What we wanted to do out there and what we were able to do is we wanted to have indoor fire, something that where we can have a fire inside. That means a lot of cut firewood, and that means a lot of split firewood. It's very popular to have a small Swedish axe that's super thin and razor sharp, which in my personal opinion is pretty much a carpenter's tool. It's not really a forest tool, regardless of what people call it. Um, an axe like this, that's a full size, three and a half pound axe that you can split big rounds with, uh, this opens up the world to you as far as fire processing. Can you do fine carving with it? We don't do fine carving with an axe anytime. And I'm sorry for stepping on people's toes on that, but that's just a fact. The knives we took were for if we needed to carve anything, which we generally didn't. But the axe, having an axe that can split six cords of firewood for your winter supply of wood, uh, that's what you want in my opinion, in that situation, because it opens the world up to you of what you can do with this tool. A small, a small light razor sharp axe, well it's good for hewing, and like, like if you're making a totem pole, it'd be perfect. Something sharp that penetrates really well, that's a, more of a carpenter's tool, perfect. But if you need to split around that big, you're never gonna do it with a little light duty you know, forest hatchet. And what this is, is peace of mind. This, this is a tool that is going to really be effective in keeping you warm, and that's a huge, huge deal. Absolutely. It seems to be the popular thing to have a very small, very light, very thin, razor sharp ax. And honestly, what you use an ax for, at least in our situation, 99% of the time, was splitting wood. If I needed to fell a tree with this ax, I could fall a tree very easy with this ax. And you did. You, lots and lots of you times. You cut down a lot of trees. But the duty that this ax got put to more than anything else was splitting firewood. You almost can't have a conversation about an ax without talking about a saw. They complement each other. They're, they're peanut butter and jelly. And uh, this is the saw that we took. Now this saw is just like the saw I grew up with and probably just like the saw you grew up with. Absolutely. Um, it is the perfect size. It's so sturdy. It feels like it's not ever going to break. And another super, super reliable tool that we just did not want to be without. There's a lot of saws out there. There's a lot of folding saws. People are really passionate about their saws. And we just like the old school bow saw. And I was so satisfied with this saw out there. And we. We cut cords of wood with this, not only building our cabin, but you know, processing firewood. And we, to think that you could rely on this blade and this saw every single day for your warmth, for your ability to stay out there, I, I would not pick any other saw. And what, this is a $5 saw? Yeah, I think, that we picked I think up. We I mean, if you, if you get the gist of our, uh, our gear taste here, we get a lot of secondhand gear, we get a lot of old gear, but we feel really confident in that gear and, and this is definitely one of those one of those choices. Now this axe head, 
I bought at a at a yard sale for four dollars I think the handle cost me twelve dollars the handle is worth more dollars and cents wise than the head is but this is a got to be a hundred year old axe this is what our grandparents used to build the country with it's just plenty good for us the bow saw we got this at a yard sale I think it was five bucks we put a new blade on it but yes uh, Actually, we didn't. No, we the didn't. The blade we took was, it was in such good shape. That's right. Right, we actually took the blade that this came from, from a yard sale. And it's an old saw, but it was a good, sharp blade. It's, I still use that bow saw. I love it. Wouldn't choose another saw. One thing to mention on that is uh, the longer we were there, these tools, the importance of these two tools came into such focus because if we were to break either one of them, it would have been a deal breaker. It would have totally been a deal breaker. Having that little cabin with a little fireplace area, it gave us indoor heat. It gave us a place to get dry and get warm and to cook. And it, it, it was the center of our universe out there. And without a saw, getting manageable sized firewood with an ax would have meant 10 times the work. And vice versa, if you broke the ax, uh, most of that wood that was out there was too wet to burn in a full round. It had to be split. And it would have uh, it would have really changed the whole dynamic of everything. These two tools became so important that it's good to keep that in mind before you go out that these an axe and a saw, they go together just perfectly and and I wouldn't leave home without either one of them. No, no, I wouldn't either. All right, our last item came as a bit of a surprise, to say the least, to most people. And uh, we thought maybe we'd break the internet with this one. <laughs> we chose a bar of soap for our 10th item. So, whose idea was that? That was, a, that was one of those things that when you're looking at the list they give you, of the, these are the items, and the list's on the internet. Uh, you know, one's a toothbrush and one's... No, it wasn't a toothbrush. One's like a hairbrush, and oh, one was... there's some goofy things to choose Yeah, there's sure. some goofy stuff, you know. Filler items that nobody picks. And in that list, there's there's soap. Dental floss is one of them. You can pick dental floss. But in that list, there's soap. And, uh, no, of course, nobody's ever given soap a, a thought. And we'd looked that list over a hundred times. And it started to really, you know, come to mind. It's like, you know what? Having a bar of soap, that's a game changer mentally we have we've spent a lot of time in the bush we've built um, we're going on our fourth place that we're building right now in Alaska and always while we have built we live in campers we live in tents we we do it the hard way and that means you don't have running water you don't have all the amenities that you would be accustomed to having and you kind of learn to live with that rustic life but as soon as you can get cleaned up and that might be just a kettle bath which we've taken hundreds and thousands of kettle yep. baths which is just a pot of water on the stove warmed up and you basically just kind of sponge yourself off and wash off and you wash your hair and it feels like you're back to day one if we're fishing at fish camp and you're out there for a week in the wilderness whatever you get cleaned up and you just feel like it's a brand new day. Psychologically, that's just, it's just a huge boost. That's one of the places that the whole concept for soap came from. We hadn't really given it much thought when we were looking at the list, but uh, for years and years at our fish camp in Minto Flats, Alaska, I would keep a bar of soap in my tackle box and it just became so important. You know, you got two-stroke gas and oil on your hands and fish guts and, you know, you're out there sitting by a fire, so you're covered in smoke and your hands, they got a crust on them and you just feel like garbage by day four or so. And we knew this was going to be pretty much the same thing. But out there, you get the soap out of the tackle box, lean over the boat, wash your hands off, wash your face, or go out in the middle of the lake and scoop up a big thing of water, take a bath right in the boat, and go back to camp and literally you're happy to be back at camp you're not thinking man I'd sure like to go somewhere and get a shower when Dave arrived at camp after hiking for nine days 
He was ripe, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I didn't even know I could smell that way. I mean, it was bad. And the thought that we could, and, the, and I will say too that the, the bar of soap that we took was kind of an all-purpose soap. You could wash your hair, you could wash your body. I mean, so we not only did those two things, but we also washed our clothes. Yep. And so there was like three amazing things you could do with this bar of soap. And really those days that we got cleaned up, I mean, and washing your clothes, just, it was, it was such a mental boost. And those are the things that you really need out there to stay. Uh, because everything else, everything's telling you to go home. Every day you want to go home. You want to be warm. You want to eat. You want to be clean. And here's one step closer to one of those things. Absolutely. If you go out there and it's day after day after day, fish guts and smoke and you know, sweat and whatnot, you get this big giant running calendar of days where you feel gross and nasty and they add it up. But with a bar of soap, you know, every five or six days you get cleaned up, clean your clothes up, and it's just a fresh start. You don't feel like you've been out there for months on end. You feel like you've been out there for a week. Now you're cleaned up and it's it's enjoyable again. And the soap I would do it again. Totally. Two thumbs up. I would take it again, for sure. Absolutely. That's a shocker to a lot of people. And that's our ten items. We each got to take five, and a couple of those were duplicates, but uh, everything except the pan, I would do again. When it comes to the items we each got to take as givens, uh, we each took a sleeping bag. I've got a review of the bag I took, which is a British military bag. Brooke has a review of the Wiggies bag that she took. We'll post those links below if you guys want to check out those videos. We had a half inch by six inch ferro rod and it just makes good sense to take the biggest ferro rod you can get your hands on to. Just to know that you're never going to wear it out. We each got to take a knife. That was a gimme. And uh, I took a Condor Woodlaw, which I still haven't cleaned up yet. <laughs> This thing is, this thing is, has seen its, its day. It is, this is one nasty knife still. I've got to clean it up. But this was a, a blank that Dave ordered and then he put the scales on. It's a flamed maple. And then I made the sheath and kept track of the days with tick marks on my sheath. And I think you did the same thing. Yep. And so we've got a smaller type knife and it was contrasted by a bigger knife and we did that on purpose. Yeah, absolutely. The knife I took was a uh, Condor Hudson Bay. Uh, both of these knives we kind of bought for this purpose as opposed to taking something that we already had or like, okay, we want a small knife. We want it to be easy to sharpen. We want a large knife. We want that to be easy to sharpen. There's no sense in taking two small knives or two bolos or whatever so we just we bought a couple of knives that we thought fit the bill and very happy with both of them very happy i mean the small knife i we use exclusively for cleaning all of our fish the bigger knife we did a lot of batoning of our smaller stuff inside um it made a good machete too right it also worked good as a hatchet anything that yeah. you needed to just chop on uh, kind of a good go between between a knife and a hatchet so yeah, having one of each, um, <laughs> there's the big question. If you can only take one, which are, one are you going to take? Um, we were blessed because we could have one of each. And I will say at one point Dave thought he lost his knife, and that's a good story for another video. Yeah, that's a story for another video. But uh, I think I would definitely, I, for me personally, this is the knife I would have taken even if I went alone. I wouldn't take a big knife. What's your thoughts? I'll say the same thing. Um, I, I'm a guy that likes a, a just a regular, small, modest-sized knife. Taking a big knife, I will say I found a million uses for a big knife. And I'm not a carver. I'm, I'm not a guy that sits around and whittles, so I don't really care about making spoons or, or whatnot. But having something to chop with, I found a million times I was reaching for this knife to chop. And... I would take my knife again too. Hmm. So there you go. One thing I'll say on that too, um, I would be happy with a knife the size of the one Brooke has. 
and it also has a good point. It's got a nice sharp point to it where this knife, it's just kind of got a big blah point. And you do, you do need a good point. Having something like a stitching awl, something that's solid with a razor sharp point would be very helpful. So if you had a big knife with a point or a small knife, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah. that, that's it guys. There, there's our 10 items plus our, uh, you know, our give me's, which were the knives, the clothes on our back, the ferro rod and sleeping bag. That that's 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 the gear we took with us. You know, I think it's funny when you you take a look at the gear we took and really break it down to what it was. We we took a five dollar bow saw, we took a twelve dollar old axe, we took a two dollar coffee pot. All the fishing line probably came in under about seven bucks. It's all eagle claw monofilament from Walmart. The tarps cost about 50 bucks each off of eBay, and they also were a fire retardant yep. uh, type of tarp, too. They were a little bit more expensive, but really heavy duty. Those were 12 by 12s, right? Yes, 12 by 12s. 12 by 12 tarps, so two of those. The GORP, whatever the cost of the, that would be. I don't know, what was the GORP? Probably probably 10 or 12 probably bucks. Probably 10 bucks a piece. Yeah, for your two, you know, it was two pounds each, just four pounds of. Two and a half pounds. Two and a half pounds. Okay. Two and a half pounds each. So we had five pounds of gorp that lasted us 40 days. Uh, Brooke had a good sleeping bag. Uh, the bag I took was, was military, but it was it was also a good bag. But that's a one place that I would probably say not to cut corners is... Definitely. You know, you want to be warm at night. You want to be cozy. Uh, a cheap sleeping bag. That's not the place to be it's cheap. That's not the place to Although my bag, it was only, I think, $200. My Wiggy's bag, I mean, it really is quite affordable. In the world I was happy of, with my bag overall. In the world of expedition level sleeping bags, 200 bucks is a drop in a bucket. Yeah. But we could have bought all the rest of our stuff 10 times over for 200 bucks because there really is a place to spend money on outdoor gear and there's a place where you don't need to spend money. And uh, that's a video for another time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the tarps though. Absolutely not a place to cut corners on your tarp. Any tarp is better than no tarp, but a good tarp. In the color that you want, which is white for us, you don't really find a white tarp at your neighborhood um, hardware store, so I had to go online for that one. But really, pretty pretty cheap secondhand gear for the most part. Yeah, the tarps were definitely something. If we had it to do over again, not even a question. Same tarps, spend the money for them. Sleeping bags were, they were good. Like I think the sleeping bags are probably the most expensive thing we took. Good bags are worth money. Well guys, that's gonna do it for us. I am Girl in the Woods. And I'm Bush Rat. I'm not Bush Rat, I never say that. You don't say you're Bush Radical? Never, no. The channel's called Bush Radical. Okay. I call you Bush Radical. That's just weird. <laughs> okay, let me do that over. All right, go ahead. So hey guys, that's going to do it for me. This is Girl in the Woods, and thank you to my guest, Bush Radical, also known as Dave Whipple, my honey. This will be 20 years <laughs> this year for us. 20 years. 20 years of being 20 married. 20 years. <laughs> 22 years of being together. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Joy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching Bush Radical. My name is Dave Whipple and my lovely wife, Brooke Whipple. Girl Be radical, eh? Oh, I stepped oh, on you. Oh, you stepped I on stepped me. I stepped on you. This is a good outtake. <laughs> that's all right. So, hey guys, that's. So, hey guys, that's going to do it for me. Thanks for joining me today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Love to hear your comments below on what ten. ten I'd love to hear your comments below on what items you would take if you got to go on the show alone. And as always, if this is your first time here, I'd love to have you subscribe. Hit that button. All right, guys. Girl in the woods. All right, guys. Thanks for joining me. See you next time. That's not my normal outtake. Oh, you blew it. Yeah. Uh, hey, guys. This is Girl in the Woods. Until next time. She gone.
<laughs> no, that's dumb. I won't use that. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to do an abnormal one today. I'll just put a buttload of outtakes on the end. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. See you next time. Peace out. No. Thank you guys so much for watching Bush Radical. My name's Dave Whipple, and this is my beautiful wife, Brooke. Oh, were you pointing at the dog? No, I was pointing <laughs> at you. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks for watching. Be radical, eh? See you soon. Ugh. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you doing? She wants more cranberries. She loves me more. What we need to do is you take your dog and you stuff her in your backpack. So when you get where you're going, you got your doggy. Watch your toes, Daisy. There's saws and stuff on the ground. They're gonna get you. Is there anything you want to recover? No, I think some of it dragged on too long. Oh I'm, yeah. I probably am gonna edit. I'm gonna chop stuff. it way down. Yeah, I'm gonna too. probably take most of probably you out. Probably take all of you out. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of a windbag. Ah. Uh.